My first name is Alvin, A-L-V-I-N, middle initial A, last name Gould, G-O-U-L-D, and I was born in Janesville, Wisconsin on September 21st, 1929, which makes me currently 84 years old. Please tell me about the, your, your family, your siblings, and the school you went through. Okay, well, um, my parents, naturally they've been long deceased, but um, um, my pen, fa father worked for the Parker Pen Company that made pens worldwide. Yeah, they were all made in Janesville, Wisconsin. He worked there for 41 years. And my mother was a homemaker, even though she was on a radio show for a number of years as an assistant on a cooking show on the radio station WCLO. And I actually was on a Saturday morning program at age four, a weekly program at WCLO, singing and so forth at that time. Wow. I have two sons, uh, Randy and Todd. Uh, they uh, are only three years apart. And um, I have, um, let's see, on grandsons, I have my son Randy has uh, two uh, that were from a current marriage and one from his original wife, which is my grandson Tanner. Okay. And um, actually, Todd has also been married twice. He had no children of the first marriage, but he has three children, Caleb, <coughs> and twin, a boy and a girl, Reese and Mackenzie. And we now have um, Tanner's married, and um, so is uh, one of the stepsons of Randy. We now have three great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So that sort of ages us right off the bat. Okay. Were you the only son? Yes, and I have one sister. Okay. So tell me about the school you went through. Was it in Wisconsin? Yes, I went to grade school and high school in Janesville, Wisconsin. And I went on to college, uh, Rizzo School of Music, R-I-Z-Z-O in Chicago, where I got my music training. But my academics were at the Loyola Lewis Tower um, campus in Chicago. And so was Rizzo School of Music. And I was working toward my degree in classical accordion when I went in service and it wasn't that I wanted to be a classical accordionist but I wanted to be a jazz accordionist but it seems like anybody who ever did well in jazz has a classical background so consequently I was going to school to try to better my technique and abilities by looking for a degree in classical accordion. Are you talking about college degree? Yes. Okay. Bachelor of Music. When, when was it? What year? Well, I went over a period of years. I started before, uh, college, uh, before Korea, and then on, on the GI Bill, I went back after Korea. No, I, I want to ask you, when were you in college? What year? Oh, Jackie, I started there probably in... 48 or 49. About maybe 49 to 50 and through there. Mm -hmm. And then I went back there in about 55, 56. I see. So you were at actually in the college when the Korean War broke out? Yes. Mm. Did you know anything about Korea around that time? Uh, no, I just know it was a conflict that was getting worse all the time. And being an accordion player, I knew uh, if, I, if I was drafted, uh, I couldn't get into an army band or anything playing the accordion, mm. so I started cramming very quickly the clarinet, and believe it or not, it's almost unbelievable, I passed the audition to be a clarinet player in an army band. And uh, I don't know if you want any information on that at all. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I actually well, enlisted, I was RA. Um, actually, I took my audition to be in an army band at Fort Sheridan, and um, when I uh, was accepted, they gave me a choice of several different places I could go. And I chose Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And uh, I was only the second person in history that Fort Leonard Wood was a direct enlistment into the band. And I took my basic training 
for infantry and everything on detached service. I was already a member of the band first, and I was with them, and then took basic training in detached service. So, when when did you have audition for Army Band? When was it? 1950? Uh, that would have to have been, let's see, that would have been in 52 because I went into the Army in 52. Ah. I went in uh, February 25th of 52. Have you ever thought that you would be fighting in Korean War? I, at first, I'm going to say no, because I thought by being in an Army band, uh, I wouldn't be sent to Korea. But uh, it was a situation, unbeknownst to Jack and I, who joined me at Fort Leonard Wood, and we bought a mobile home because we thought we'd be there my whole three years in enlistment. They took the last 12 members of the Army band and sent them overseas, six to Europe and six to Korea, and I was going over as an infantryman. So that um, it kind of shook me up a little bit. Yeah. But as we go along, you can see how I was able to change and get to where I was eventually in Korea. So when did you first know that you are going to you are going to be in Korea? When did you first? Well, know? I left October twenty fifth. How did you feel about that? I mean, were you scared? Well, I was didn't know what was going to happen, but I was very fortunate right off the bat. I found out that they were looking for some entertainers to play aboard ship going over, and I was one of six that I was playing two shows a day with the accordion and aboard the USS Walker, General Walker, on the way to Japan. Mm. Do you want me to continue on what happened then? Yes. Okay, when I got to Japan, um, I had been told, told aboard ship that there was a, just like I think in all army bases, when I went into Camp Drake, that they had a special service section. So I jumped line while we were all being processed. There was 4,300 of us, and we were only going to be in Japan for maybe 36 to 48 hours. But I jumped line, went over, and found the special service section. And I said, is there any way you could use me here? They said, let's hear you play. So I quickly played a solo. They said, go back in line, we'll, we'll take you. And uh, to make a long story short, I think this is kind of funny. When I got back at the, in the tail end of the lines, when the sergeant got to me, he asked me who I was, and I gave my name, rank, and serial number. He said, no, who really are you? I said, what do you mean? He said, of all the 4,300 are being processed today, you're the only one not going to Korea. So he said, who the hell are you? And I just, I just said my rank and serial number again. But when I reported to the special service section, this was uh, early November. We were aboard ship maybe almost two weeks. They said that what they wanted me for was to play at the officers' club on New Year's Eve. And they could only hold me two weeks. And here it was for early November. So they said, we'll have you witnesses at court martials and whatever we can to hold you here until then. And uh, I'm trying to make a long story short again, even though I was playing shows, and if you want to hear more about it, in Japan, which I think were very interesting, I found out that there was a 10th Special Service Company in Korea. And uh, th there was a place you could audition there in Japan. And I went, and a gal by name Margaret Skippy Lin, she was a DAV, Department of Army Civilian, I took my audition there. And uh, believe it or not, we passed it. And they had one of the three accordion players. There were three show platoons in Korea. Each one had one accordion player. And one was rotating home on the 2nd of January. So the good Lord was with me. I was his replacement. So I was shipped from Japan on the 2nd, or I think, of January to Korea as a member of 10th Special Service Company. So that's uh, 1953. That was, uh, yeah, it was actually the first couple of days of 53. Tell the, me, you didn't want to go to Korea, or, or what's on your mind at the time? Well, I didn't want to be an infantryman in Korea, even though they are, I feel, the true heroes of Korea. But um, everybody is very important. I went there, all the support. I understand about 18 support are from one that's actually fighting. But... Um, uh, I was then looking forward to going to Korea, 
and we'll naturally hear a lot more, but while I was still in Japan, I had the privilege of playing at the Ernie Pyle Theater, the Rocker Four Club, other places around um, Tokyo, and et cetera. And we did tour down as far as, uh, what was it, the Kamkura, where the Buddha is, and did shows. So, but then I went to naturally Korea. You must be very good to be selected out of that kind of emergency basis, right? Well, actually, we can get more of my background if you want to. I yeah. can, can come later or now, whatever you want. Yeah, tell me about your background. Well, I was started taking accordion lessons at age nine, and there in Wisconsin, was state of Wisconsin. But age 13, I was state amateur champion on the accordion, wow. again at 14 and 15. And at age 16, I joined the Federation of Music Unions and turned professional. So, um, and I hadn't actually a good teacher back then, but I was introduced and was able to go on after high school to study at Andy Rizzo at the Rizzo School of Music in Chicago. And I might be um, prejudiced, but I think he's the world's greatest accordion player. And any jazz accordionist, he had a lot of concert accordion players too, but any jazz accordionist like Art Van Damme or uh, Leon Sash or like name off a bunch of them, that's who they studied with. So I had the pleasure of studying with Andy before I went to Korea, which got me into shape that I could do what I did do in Korea. Wow. So if there were not Korean War, what do you think that you would have been? Well, I might have ended up being a jazz accordionist. But uh, this can all come later. But I did, uh, after Korea, and I'll try to make it very short, I ended up back in Wisconsin after deciding not to go on the road. We were married. And if, we were to, if I was going on the road to try to become more and more known, I'd it'd be traveling. It wouldn't be very good for home life. So I started a Google School of Music. And by the time I sold it in 69 and moved to Phoenix, I had, had a 13,500 square foot music store with 43 employees, of which 21 were teachers. And we taught uh, 750 private lessons a week and they were actually, uh, only five of us were accordion teachers, and I was naturally the advanced accordion. But we were taught strings, brass, you name it, piano, organ, guitar. So, did Korean War service of yours help your career, or do you think that because of the Korean War, you didn't become a sort of famous musician rather than I think being a businessman. I think it helped my career in a different light way. It learned me and I still try to use it today. You have to actually promote yourself to succeed. And actually I actually did succeed from nothing to that large music store in not too many years. And I uh, still went on to my selling. I won't get into that we're here for my Korean, but I was very successful in my selling career and still am. How did Korean War Service help you promote your business? It made me know how I look at practicing and becoming like a state champion is the same as practicing on how to sell. I, I think they are parallel. In other words, I did take training from Tom Hopkins, also uh, Zig Ziglar, who were supposed to be great instructors on how to sell. And I put in forth what they did, but I kept promoting myself and how to sell. Okay, um, so where did you arrive in Korea? I, I got in Korea, I think, about the 4th of January of 53. Mm -hmm. Where did you arrive? I landed at Incheon, and believe it or not, I had to go over the side of the ship down a rope ladder carrying my duffel bag and a AWOL bag. So that was <laughs> that was my introduction to Korea. How was Korea? The first thing that you saw at the time? Well, it was in John Harbor. And I was taken to Seoul, where the headquarters was of the 10th Special Service Company. But I wasn't there hardly at all. Uh, the 10th Special Service Company, which will go more in detail to their background and so forth, but I was on the road 24 7. I was not into Seoul hardly at all till after the ceasefire. So, what was the scene that you saw in Korea for the first time? How was it? Uh, everything devastated? It, it actually people. Looked, looked very hilly, 
very hilly, and naturally when I was there in Seoul, it was very desolated, very bombed out. About the only thing left standing was the chosen hotel and a few other things. But the um, I forget the name of it, but so the mansion that Sigma Rhee was in didn't get touched. Gyeongmude. Yeah, and um, actually both sides, I think, wanted to protect the chosen hotel and a few things, but most everything was very bombed out. How is it? belong to special service company what is the what is your daily routine and what is your duties and how is it to belong to that special okay can service? i give you a quick background what Ab absolutely okay actually 10 special service company was started in late 1944 by two people josh logan who you might recognize the name of later uh, came he was a captain in guam at the time but he went on to write South Pacific and other musicals and worked with Oscar Hammerstein and Roy, um, I was going to say Roy Rogers, uh, uh, what, uh, Richard Rogers. And um, actually the other person was this uh, Skippy Margaret Lynn, the DAV, Department of Civilian. She had actually been in Carousel, Oklahoma, was understudied with Ethel Merman, and uh, take it to the boys, and was the drill instructor for the Rockettes near at the Radio Hall, uh, Music Hall. So what a tremendous startup this company had, and she was the one that actually made up the three shows that were on the road. We um, actually, I joined one was already in existence, but each show before they went to Korea, practiced in Japan and went together into Korea. I joined when it was already in progress. But the second platoon I was in started out, they call it um, Take 10, that was the original name. And uh, actually it changed names to Road to Ruin in October of 52. Uh, uh, and uh, I was actually joined them in early January of 53. So what is the routine, everyday okay, routine? Okay, the routine was we would put on about an hour show uh, and least, usually at least once a day, sometimes more. And as I said earlier, we were on the road 24-7. And we had special passes signed by General Maxwell Taylor that could get us through any checkpoint because they were all over the place. You were usually in one area. We were 24 hours a day. We could go through any checkpoint, no matter what, to get to where we had to go next. And we did play shows within 500 yards of the MLR. And I, I'm going to backtrack quickly. I'll make it quickly fit. But the reason the 10th Special Service Company was started, the Army wanted to have the troops in forward areas to have more entertainment. And the USO shows that came over, which some are very good, like Bob Hope and so forth, they couldn't play shows any closer than 20 miles from the main line of the resistance, the MLR, where we played within 500 yards MLR, and um, naturally all over the place, mass units, you name it. But we played shows occasionally where our artillery shells outgoing were going over our heads while we were playing shows. And they would bring uh, maybe, I don't know what percentage, but I'm going to use the word 50% of those that are on the MLR back to hear a show and they'd go back to the MLR and they'd bring the other 50% to us and then we'd move on to someplace else. So. Ten special company, service company, must be very popular to the American soldier, right? Very much so. Um, Tell me about those. When you first, when you move into a point where that the all soldiers gathered and waiting for you guys to perform, and tell me about those scenes. Okay. Remember? Do you remember those? Yes. Uh, actually, we had equipment. We had uh, actually. I'll get to this maybe later, but we had thirteen vehicles in our convoy, and uh, we carried with us actually. Uh, backdrop, um, things for the, I, I use the word stage loosely, we usually played standing or sitting right on the ground. And I should have interjected this earlier, but to get in the 10th Special Service Company, most of them, you already heard how I got in, but most everybody in it had been in a name band like Betty Goodman, Woody Herman, you name it, back in the States. And when they were drafted or enlisted, they automatically ended up in the 10th Special Service Company and celebrities like Eddie Fisher, you name it, of that day, or they were comedians or singers or what, they ended up in the 10th Special Service Company. Ah. So consequently, I was playing usually two 
in uh, solo numbers. And uh, there was a number of band arrangements were, which I thought were fantastic. In my uh, platoon, we actually had a, a hypnotist, which I didn't believe this could happen, but I saw him perform. I know he couldn't set anything up. We had His name was Ralph Weiss. He was a hypnotist in our show. Uh -huh. We had a country singer from Nashville, and uh, we had a couple other singers, but um, it was uh, a variety show. How this special band, uh, special company, service band, received by the soldiers? Fantastically well. We had, they vary from 12 to 15 pieces, depending who was rotating home and who was coming in. But they were pl uh, playing songs of the day, and we had, I don't know, I, this I can't remember, if these were special with our unit or they were some of the musicians in the unit, but we did our own charts or what they call arrangements. So we were always playing different songs right along for the band, and it was extremely well received. What was the most popular song to them? Popular song? Yeah. Boy, that would be awful, awful hard. I don't know if I can pick any one song. I know the country western guy, they like Jambalaya. Jambalaya? Yeah. And? And uh, there were others too. But um, they were playing songs of the day. I was playing myself basically songs of the World War II area, what I call standards. Mm -hmm. I wasn't playing the pop songs that were popular right, about, right, right then. Um, can you name any body in your company, very famous later, became f very famous later? Well, a guy by name, his name was Park Adams, and I have a picture I can give you. Mm -hmm. he, um, his nickname was Pepper Adams, and he went on, and you, if you went on Google and looked up, there's about two pages. They felt he was the world's greatest baritone player, sax player of all time. He's now deceased, but he became extremely well-known and famous. Naturally, Eddie Fisher, who was in the third platoon at the same time I was in the second platoon, was very well-known. So, um, so you were actually living with the legend? Yes. How was it? I mean, they are not regular soldiers. They are not infantrymen. They don't fire. They perform the instruments. Yeah. And how do they behave there? Uh, how do they react to the war, and how do they behave? They behaved well, but we all had infantry training in basic, and we carried our rifles and everything with us. But we never did have to fight. And um, I'll make this quick story and get back to your question directly. But once we were playing at the MLR, uh, some of the Chinese broke through during the night, and um, actually a lot of rifle fire and stuff was going on, and I slept through it, and everybody was kidding me. The next day here they actually captured these Chinese right around where I was and I slept through the whole thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. I don't think you were qualified to be a musician there. <laughs> you sleep through. <laughs> oh. How do they behave, the, the members of the 10th Special? They behave very well. Uh, we occasionally would play an extra show we had our, our own itinerary blocked out, but if an officers or somebody wanted a special slow, if we were a place where it was a mess hall, we would play an extra show if they would give us steaks or whatever, thing like that. So actually we did special things now and then, but we played for all United um, Nation troops. We played for the Turks, the British, the Australians, ROK, you name it, we played them for all. And uh, to one of the things I kind of laughed at too, which was scary to me, when we were with the Turks, they all carried daggers strapped to their legs. And I understand when the North Koreans or the Chinese didn't want to fight against the Turks at all because they got slashed up. And so, um, but they were actually scary to be with. The British, I have to laugh them in a different way. I think they were wonderful when we were with the British for two weeks. But um, they were the most uncleansy of anybody who ever saw. Uncleansing? We yes, when we ate with them in their mess gear or mess tents or mess halls, wherever it was. Uh, and this is winter time. The place where you'd wash your mess gear afterwards, the hot water and the other tanks, the rinse, were frozen over. 
and uh, what, uh, a guy would come around the tables carrying a loaf of bread in his hand, slicing and throwing the slices of bread on the table. It was a very messy situation with the British. Debbie Reynolds and some of those came over in the USO shows, but they had to be at least 20 yards, I mean 20 miles back from the front lines. Debbie Reynolds came over while she was had previously been dating Eddie Fisher, and they got married after Korea. So Fred, Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds, Debbie Reynolds became husband and wife. Any other movie star or the famous uh, talented uh, career men and women came to Korea and impressed you? Well, I rotated home before Marilyn Monroe was there. Oh, too bad. And I, uh, actually, Bob Hope, I don't know if he had a Christmas show when I was there or not, but I wasn't in Korea until the 2nd or 3rd of Jan January. Of 1953. Three, yeah. so if he, if he was there in 52, I missed it. So you missed everybody? Yeah, well, you we missed were, Marilyn Monroe uh, and, yeah. and Bob Hope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Can you think of any anybody else famous movie star or well, the, a lot singer? of them did come over when we play. I played uh, our platoon played for Sigmund Ray. Oh, tell right, me about and, that. And, and where, uh, where? At his mansion. And when I, was it? I, it was probably about uh, at the end of the ceasefire. I don't, I. Jackie didn't keep my letters home, and I had never kept a diary or uh, while I was there, so I don't have the exact dates. But when we played for um, uh, Sigmund Rhee, got to shake hands with him, I thought it was tremendous. But in came, and Jackie helped me if I get the Ironmans, but two movie stars came in the door while we were moving, and one was, can you remember the names, Jackie? Jan, Jan Sterling was the gal. Jan what? Sterling was the lady, and the the man's name was Paul Douglas. Paul Douglas. They were visiting Sigmund President's Rion. mansion while yeah, you moving. Yeah, he, they were probably with some USO entertainers coming in after us. How did uh, Sung Man Ri react to your performance? Very well. He seemed to really enjoy it. Music is an international statement. You, uh, it's a situation, no matter what language you speak or what country you're from, music's international. Did he speak to you guys? Uh, I don't remember that much. I don't know if he speaks English. Oh, he uh, speaks very good English. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. This I don't remember. He got the PhD from Princeton University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before you were born. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that's... Well, I had the honor of playing Sigmund Ray. I had the armor uh, playing four times for President Truman before I came to Korea when I was with the 326th Army Band because oh. that was Missouri and that was uh, Truman's whole state. And when he came there, we were this honor band that traveled with him, whether it was Springfield or what, playing ruffles and furnishes while he came in. And then we were taking the next stop and did it again. And he put the back of the uh, ground buses with the soft drinks and beers, a competence of Harry. So I got to play with him, uh, for him also. So you met Sung Man Ri, yeah. President Truman, before you come to Korea. Mm -hmm. any, any other VIPs that you played for? Oh, fan, I, can you help me, Jack, or not? I, Only high-ranking officers. I played for a lot of high-ranking officers. But um, I gave accordion lessons after the ceasefire, and I was back at 8th Army Headquarters, which 8th Army Headquarters, 10th, 10th Special Service Com Company is called the Adjutant General Corps uh, of the 8th Army Headquarters. And I did have three or four high-ranking members taking accordion lessons from me. Mm. I didn't ever meet General Van Fleet personally, but I have seen him. Um, this is kind of, I wanted to ask this question. How did you feel being in special service company while all others are going into MLR or any other places and fighting there in the front line? I felt very sorry for him. We were at mass units every now and then. I got to see some very severely wounded people. 
Uh, actually, I refused the Purple Heart. I'm laughing at this. While I was unloading one of the DUSAFs, or our mass units, I fell off and really gouged up a bloody, bloody mess on one of my legs and got emergency first aid at a mass unit. And when you are getting first aid there, your name goes on record for the Purple Heart. And I had fought for two weeks to get my name off the record because I didn't want coming up in my hometown newspaper wounded in action. And a lot of people said I should have taken the Purple Heart, but I would have found terrible because I was not a real hero, even though I've been told a lot of different times now. Keeping up morale was a hero thing to do also. Absolutely. You did right thing to take your name off of the list of Purple Heart, but you just made the point that you really raise up the morale of the soldiers. I think that's a great thing for, for any soldier to do. What do you think? Well, very much so, and I'm, I'm getting maybe ahead of myself, but Sonny, who was here with us, knows that you were, were you at the uh, Ward's Banquet there in Korea? Yep. You know, I was one of six brought up the stage, and stating you the that accordion. as I got special merit of service award for keeping up morale of the troops while I was in Korea. Yeah, many soldiers still, they may remember, remember the music they heard and the performance they saw during their service. And I know they do because I've gotten actually emails from people that have seen me. I was written up in a Reminisce magazine article which gave my name and phone number and address. And I've been contacted by a number of servicemen who I did not know who were, were not intense specialists, sent me pictures they took of me playing. You playing? Uh, yes, or of our show, too. Wow. I have pictures to give you here at Bulldozer Bowl and stuff of me playing. Wow, that would be great. So since you mentioned about you playing accordion, why don't you play for us? Huh? Could you oh, do okay. that? Okay, sure. Actually, um, just for the fun of it, um, You'll hear a little bit later what I did in Korea, but I like to take a simple, well-known standard song and let's put a few little embellishments in it just for the fun of it. That you played in Korea during the war. Okay, do you want the Korean one first? No, 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 no. The piece that you played during the Korean War. Actually, uh, I, you're going to hear it there a little bit. But... <laughs> And so forth. I'm not, not in shape now, but you'll hear it when I was in shape shortly. But I can play now, just uh, take a, a standard song and uh, just add a little bit to it. <laughs> fantastic but it's a lot of fun <laughs> so I don't know what any more now here or and stop this and we can put this one right in with it next I I rather want you to play 
And any other piece that will remind you of your service, that's the one that I want okay, you to play. I'm going to take this one. I, uh, it's America, the beautiful, and the medley with, um, let's see, what's the name of the other song here, Jack? The one I played in Korea uh, at the uh, show over there. Oops.
Hello. That's one. Thank you very much playing accordion for us and I think that reminded you of your performance and your service during the war right correct what are you what are you thinking right now well I'm thinking I'm I'm am now proud of what I did in Korea yes you must be proud of yourself in order to help people get away from what was happening for just a few, an hour or so, give them some uplift in their morale, which hopefully lasted for a while. So where did you, when did you leave Korea? I left, I think, about the 3rd or 4th of January of 54, uh, was that about right, Jackie? Yeah. Have you been back? You've been back to Korea, right? Yeah, I was back there last September. Left here on 9/11, which I thought was a very safe time to fly because security be very <laughs> high, heavy. And uh, I spent um, six days and five nights in Korea as on, on their revisit program. What did you see there? Well, it was fantastic, and there, uh, there isn't enough time here to say it say it all. But uh, we went down to the Pusan perimeter and saw a reenactment of the battle that took place there. We saw the reenactment of the General um, MacArthur landing at Incheon. Uh, we got to, to go out to Panmujan. We saw all kinds of things. And what surprised me was naturally that city is as modern as any city in the world. And I think I remember them saying, you're now about the second or third largest city in the world of 34 million people, and I know when we were on our tour buses going south toward the um, Panmujan perimeter, um, we were cutting right through all these hills, and the, the, all the walls were like ceramic tile walls, beautiful, beautiful highways. It was fantastic. Were you proud that you served there? Very much so. Now, the people were so wonderful to us. They can't seem to thank us enough. And actually I got to meet a number of other GI, some I, I went with, I knew a few, but I met two different ones that had on their hats veterans of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. I thought that was kind of fantastic, fantastic to run into people that were in all three wars. So have you ever imagined that the Korea you fought for in 1950s and the Korea in today now. Have you thought ever imagined that Korea will develop like this? No, I never had, but they're now one of the world leaders. And I think they're about number 10 in production of goods at the present time and are probably still rising. They're definitely one of our world leaders now and are still getting better all the time. So what is Korea to you now? Well, it's a very important world-leading country, and I was proud to have helped maybe serve there to help them get to where they are today. You know, my part was very small. Everybody's role was small, but all together mm -hmm. you accomplished such a mm -hmm. good thing, right? Yep, mm. very much so. Any other message that you want to leave to this interview? 
I don't think so. I'm going to take a quick look at some pictures, see if I felt I had left something out. Oh, well, this was, I was one most proud of thing. I was award, um, awarded, and I won't try to go through it all now, but uh, the combination ribbon, which is a very high award, and uh, uh, you'll be able to read this later, but uh, it was for my service with the 2nd Platoon, and I had developed into one of the show leaders of the platoon. And they gave me a tremendous write up here on being awarded the accommodation medal. Mm. And you're going to share all those pictures and your memorabilia with me, right? Yeah, you can have them all. There's a picture of our chief warrant officer and herself way above the 38th parallel. That was before the ceasefire, where the farthest north you could get at the time. Do you want to show that picture to the camera? Well, it might not be real, real good, but this is the one on top. Are you in the left side of it? Pardon me? Are you the tall one or the short one? This is one. This is right at the 38th parallel. Uh huh. And this is not too many GIs have been there. Um, Freedom Village. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually, while it was in the process of being made, we never played for any people there, but while the engineers, construction and medical were there helping to get it started. You never regret to be in Korea? Not at all. If I had it to do over again, I would do it over again. Do it over again? I would do it over again. I that's amazing, huh? Uh, here's after the ceasefire, but a six-piece combo when we were playing around Seoul at the time. Where are you? I'm the accordion player. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's you are. Was it in Seoul? This was in Seoul. We did a lot of playing there, and even though the shows were all disbanded, um, we did play quite often for re generals when they were returning home. And we'd go to the Chosen Hotel or wherever it was, so we were still getting entertainment, whether it would be a makeup of the bigger band or something smaller like mm. this. I want to thank you for your service, special service company that has raised the morale high up to the sky of the American soldiers, and you greatly contributed to the victory of the Korean War. Thank you very much. I much appreciate what you're saying. I mean it, and it's from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much for your interview. Okay, thank you.